All right, so let's pick up where we left off on Monday. Okay, so we um, were looking at this synthesis on the bottom. All right, so we're trying to convert a primary alcohol to an extended ketone. So we need to add carbons to it, and uh, we need to end up with a ketone. All right, so we have to have some type of oxidation involved as well. So what we started out by doing is adding or treating that alcohol with PCC, so that oxidizes the primary alcohol to the aldehyde, and so then we are ready to add something to that aldehyde. Okay, so maybe we would do something similar to what we just saw on the clicker question. All right, so if we add, how many carbons do we have to add? Just two, right? Because we already decided that this part of the molecule is the same as this part right here. Okay, so we have to add two more. So we could add that. Let's do it this time with a organolithium. Remember, and this we would make from the halogen, treating it with lithium metal. <coughs> All right, so that's going to add. We have step two. Remember, this is a single synthetic step, but we have to do these two parts sequentially. All right, what happens if we just mix it all up together? We put the aldehyde, the um, ethyl lithium, and the water all together. Do we get the product that we want? No, why not? Right, the, the, the water will just react with the with the ethyl lithium, right? Because remember, those organometallics are very basic, and so the fastest reaction is just going to be an acid-base reaction, right? And in fact, if we add them all together, ethyl lithium with water, you know, is so reactive, we may end up with a fire, okay? So we need to do that sequentially, and when we do add water, we drip it in very slowly to make sure that it doesn't get out of control. Okay, so we get to this alcohol, and then how do we get up to the ketone over there? Just an oxidation, right? We could use PCC again, or we could use any of those chromic, you know, acid, chromium trioxide, sulfuric acid, uh, sodium dichromate, sulfuric acid, any of those combinations. Okay, so I think one of the points here is let's look at, um, at our product there. Um, okay, so here's the product. We made this molecule by forming this bond right here. Okay, but if we were just trying to make that ketone, we could equally form the bond over on the other side. Right, because from this alcohol, um, we could also make that with a Grignard, like or a Grignard organic lithium like this, plus this aldehyde. Right, so we could form either of those bonds. Turns out the way you know the exact problem that I gave you, it's probably easier to do it this way, but you know, an, another alternative is we could convert this alcohol into a halide, right? we could treat it with uh, PDR3 or something and make the bromide, and then we could make this part into the Grignard and react that with the shorter aldehyde, right? it would be getting to the same place. All right. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. So with these organolithiums and the vineyards, can we isolate these compounds? Because I see that we're always like, making them in our syntheses. Do we have to like make them on site, or can you get them in a bottle? 
Okay, so good question. So, um, question is, um, can, do we have to make them kind of in situ, right, in the reaction, or can we buy them, um, isolate them, that kind of thing, okay? So, in general, they're very reactive and they're very hard to isolate, okay? So, we either have to make them in situ in the reaction, um, or for common organolithiums, or even common Grignards, um, we can buy them, okay? But the way we buy them, I think, maybe I described this, I don't know for which compound, before, that we buy them in a solution, they're in a bottle, you know, at 1.5 molar butyl lithium, which is a really common one, and so it's in a bottle with this septum on the top, it looks like a, in this case, it looks like a cap for a beer bottle or something, but it has a little hole in the top and has a rubber septum between the cap and the bottle, and so you can stick your, your needle down in there to withdraw it. So common ones we can buy as a solution if we want. If they're not so common, then we'd have to form them, you know, as, essentially as a part of the same reaction. Okay. Any other questions? All right, so let's look at just one more. Asleep in a day. If it's on a Thursday, everybody would be asleep. Okay, so let's look at this uh, transformation. Okay, so I think in always, you know, obviously the first thing, I think hopefully obviously, the first thing is you have to compare, right, the reactant product, right, and just figure out exactly what's changed. Right? And then you can try to figure out how to accomplish that. All right, so what we're looking at really, the differences, right, are on this end over here. We're going from a ketone to a methyl group. So how can we do that? Yeah, we have to lose an oxygen. So does it involve like forming H2O? It could. So the sec suggesting is it could form, involve forming H2O somewhere, right? And if we do that, what kind of a reaction would that be involved in? Dehydration. Yeah, so maybe a dehydration. Okay, so that means we need to generate an alcohol. All right, so in this process... Where would we generate an alcohol that we could dehydrate? Well, we could reduce it. So the suggestion, if we reduce that ketone to an alcohol, we would, we would get this alcohol here. And if we do a dehydration, we can form a double bond. Hopefully this one, this other alcohol, just stays there, and it would form a double bond like this, right? But we haven't added a, the methyl group yet. So how do we add a methyl group and make an alcohol at the same time? Yeah. Right, so we could use an alkyl lithium or a Grignard with a methyl group, right, that attacks the carbonyl, right? So let's do this. So we could say just use, say methyl lithium, right? So remember this carbon would have a essentially a delta minus here. So this could attack the carbonyl carbon, forms an alkoxide, a tetrahedral intermediate, that we then protonate with water. All right, so what we would end up with is this. Okay, so 
That's great. So is there any problem that you see with doing this reaction? Yeah? Yeah, what's going to happen to that other alcohol? Yeah, it's just going to get deprotonated. Remember, when I first introduced these organometallics, I said that they're so basic that if we put anything that's acidic around them, water or an alcohol or carboxylic acid or anything that can deliver a proton, all that's going to happen is acid-base chemistry and we essentially, what do we get from the, from the methyl lithium if we react that with a, with a proton source? It just picks up a proton, it's just acid base. So CH3 minus is the base, reacts with H plus, gives us methane. Okay? So the reaction is good, but in this case, we can't do the reaction in the presence of that other alcohol. All right? So we're going to have to do a process that's called using a protecting group. All right, and this is a common process in, organos, in organic synthesis. So if we have two functional groups and we want to do a reaction on one of them and the other one would be reactive as well, we have to protect or derivatize the other functional group, then do the reaction, and then we have to deprotect or uncover the functional group that we want to remain. So in this case, we, want to, we have to do something to essentially cover up or protect that primary alcohol. Okay, so then we can do the, the organometallic reaction, do whatever chemistry we won't want there, and in the end, we deprotect it, and then voila, it's still there. Okay? So I have several books that are like I have one book that's like this fat, that all it is is on protecting groups. Okay, so there's like hundreds of protecting groups that we might be able to use, but they're for different functional groups. So, but common, a common protecting group for alcohols are um, what we call silyl ethers. Okay, so silyl ethers, Silyl ethers are going to have some type of. Um, okay, I'm going to put an. Oh no, I didn't want to do it like that. I'll put some kind of an R group over here. I'll put an R prime over here. Here's our alcohol that we want to protect. A silyl ether has a silicon silyl, and then it will have three different alkyl groups attached. Okay, silicon, is, where is silicon in the periodic table? Do you remember? It's just below carbon, okay? And so it has the same kind of bonding patterns as carbon, so it likes to make four bonds. Okay, so these silyl ethers are unreactive to strongly basic conditions. So if we can protect that alcohol with a silyl ether, we could then do the reaction with the organolithium. We could do the dehydration. We can do whatever other reactions we've got to do there. And then we can remove the silyl ether and get our alcohol back. Okay? So for us, it's fine with me if we, when we're using silyl ethers, if we just draw three R groups there, okay? There's a whole bunch of different silo ethers that we can use. What the book uses is a common one, and this is like this. So these are methyl groups. So this is tert butyl. Here, where can I fit it in? Tert butyl. So that's the X thing over there, tert-butyl dimethyl silyl, okay, 
it would be a silo ether. And they just use that because it's kind of a common <coughs> one. Um, the general trend is that the bigger these groups around the silicon are, the more stable the silo ether becomes. So if you start with a very small one like trimethyl, then it's not very stable at all. In fact, if, if even just water or any tiny bit of acid or base will just cleave it off. But if you just replace one of those methyl groups with a terpetyl group, it becomes significantly more stable, right? Or if you put a common one is, um, is terpbutyl diphenyl, so it has two benzene groups here, and that becomes even more stable, all right? So it just depends on what reactions you want to do. And in some syntheses, um, you might have multiple, function, multiple protecting groups in the molecule at some point, and you want to be able to put them on and take them off independently of one another. Okay, so this one is usually called tert-butyl dimethyl silo, so they abbreviate it tert-butyl dimethyl silo, TBDMS. So you can use that if you want, or you can just go silken with three R groups, you know, like SIR3 is fine with me. Okay, so either way. All right, so that's what we want to generate. So in order to do that, we have to use the silochloride reagent. So we're going to use the same protecting group with a chlorine on it. So we're going to do a substitution reaction to make that ether. And then we have to use a base, and the common base is this one, and we've talked about this before in terms of acid-base chemistry. This one, do you remember what that's called? Probably not. I wouldn't if I were you. Pyridine almost. Pyridine is like a benzene ring with a nitrogen in it. This is imidazole. Right, remember we talked about that as trying to figure out which nitrogen would be more basic. Okay, so when we do this, what it, we're going to get is this silicon with three R groups is going to be bonded to the oxygen. Oh, I'm going to the wrong one here. We still have the ketone. Like this. Okay, so we've... Yeah, question. Quick question. Are we disregarding the first reaction? We're going around it. We're going around it, so we're, we're not going to do that at all. We're going to do it now. Okay. We protect first, then we're going to do that reaction. Because, because, because in fact, let's, let's just be clear that this one would not actually work. All right? And it would not work because we would just get an acid-base reaction. Okay, because the, green, the organolithium would just pull off the proton on the alcohol. Yeah, question. So when you're adding this protecting group, is there a way you distinguish which functional group it goes to? Because it, could it have possibly gone to the Okay, so good question. So um, the question is, we have two functional groups in the molecule. We're trying to put a protecting group. How do we know which functional group it will go on? Okay, so... As we've learned through the class, you know, different functional groups have different reactivities, right? So alcohols um, can be nucleophiles, especially if we deprotonate them or if we react them with uh, strong electrophiles. But ketones don't have the same type of reactivity. Okay, what we've seen so far is that ketones like to react with nucleophiles. All right, so... There are protecting groups, and we'll learn one in the next chapter for ketones and aldehydes. But silo ethers is not one of them, because if we try to put on a silo ether, even if it went onto the more nucleophilic end of this, this ketone, that would be the oxygen, right? and then we'd have an O with a plus charge and a silicon. It's not going to be stable. Okay, so silo ethers will only be used to uh, protect alcohol. Or they could be used to protect amines, 
Okay, but it, but not carbonyls. All right. Okay, so now that the alcohol is protected, we can do our reaction with methyl lithium. Okay, we do that. One, we add water. The silo ethers are not usually stable to real strong acid, so you have to be a little careful when you, add, when you quench this. Yeah, question? Is there a reason you're using a, a methyl lithium instead of a Grignard? No, there isn't a reason. It was just because of, the suggestion was to do uh, organolithium. <laughs> methyl magnesium bromide or chloride would work equally as well here. Right, so this is a place where you just have a choice. Okay, so we're going to get to here. We still have our protected alcohol. We've added our other methyl group, and we get to this tertiary alcohol. Okay, but now we've got to get rid of that alcohol. Right, so what reaction did we, did we talk about doing? To get rid of the OH, we wanted to form water and do a dehydration. Okay, so I'm going to make sure I can fit it all in here. I'm going to write it this way. So we're just going to add some weak acid here. Um, uh, let's use tosic acid. You guys remember what that is? Toluene sulfonic acid. Or we could just use a little bit of sulfuric acid. We just got to keep it kind of dilute acid. Okay? It's just catalytic. And so then... We... So where's the double bond going to form? So we're going to lose a proton, right? So here's our alcohol. We're going to lose a proton on a carbon adjacent to where the alcohol is attached, right? So we have these two methyl groups, and we have the CH2 group here. <coughs> Which one? The CH2, right? Because remember when we do dehydrations, it follows this Zaitsev's rule, which means that we're going to form the most stable alkene, which is the most highly substituted one. And so we're going to form a double bond like this. All right, so how do we get from here to our product? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We, if we hydrogenate it, we get rid of the double bond. We make it saturated. So we can go up here. I know this is getting kind of crowded. H2, palladium on carbon. We get to here, then we just have to remove the protecting group. Okay? We could use strong acid, but there's a real selective way to do this. Okay? And what we use is, um, well, what we, dang, there's not much room here, is there? We use fluoride, F minus. That reacts, it forms very strong bonds with silicon. Doesn't react hardly with anything else, and so it's very good at removing silyl ethers. And the way the one that we use typically is this. We're gonna put four of these tetrabutyl ammonium. Fluoride. <coughs> so the tetra, it's just ionic, tetrabutyl ammonium, it makes a salt, and all those butyl groups makes it more nonpolar, so it dissolves in an organic solvent. If we use just sodium fluoride, it might not dissolve very much in our organic solvent. 
Okay, so this, I hope you guys can follow this. Let's do a little highlight here to follow the, the right route. So we're going to go down this way, then we're going to go this way, then we're going to curve around like this, then we're going to go this way, and then we're going to come back over there. Okay? The tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride is abbreviated T, oops, ding, I always do that. So nice and blue. Um, T, B, A, F. Tetrabutyl ammonium Fluoride. Sorry about this. Okay, that's the group to remove, that's the reagent to remove the fluoride. Okay, so these silo ethers are especially stable to uh, basic reagents, they're stable to oxidations and reductions, they're not stable to strong acid, but they're a very common and a very good protecting group so it can protect an alcohol that would typically react with a much stronger base. Okay, everybody kind of follow that? So if you're, yeah. if there's alcohol involved, you should always use protection. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard that said. Any other comments? <laughs> yeah. So for the imidazole, do we have to use imidazole or can we use a strong base? Well, we don't want a strong base. Sometimes imidazole is the most common. Imidazole actually displaces the chloride and makes an even better leading group. But sometimes you can use amines like triethylamine or something like that because what happens is what we're losing is the H from the alcohol and the chloride, so we're generating hydrochloric acid in the process. So we want to be able to neutralize the hydrochloric acid as it's being formed, because if we generate too much of it, it'll just cleave the silo ether right back off. Okay, so we're trying to keep it more, more neutral. Okay? All right. All right, the last thing we're going to do here is we're going to uh, look at the alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyls. So th the key thing here is that when we add a double bond, we, add mo we have resonance, we have conjugation, and we have, uh, so we spread out positions where we could have reactions. So let's draw some resonance um, of this structure. Okay, the, the main resonance we've already talked about for the carbonyl, which describes the reactivity, the delta plus on the carbonyl carbon, is just resonance where we move the electrons of the carbonyl up onto the oxygen. So we still have the double bond, but we have a minus on the oxygen and a plus on the carbon. All right, so what other resonance can we have then for this functional group? <coughs> well, it can't move all the way around the ring, but the pi bond can move up to the plus, right? Because we have essentially an allylic cation there. So we can move this 
electron pair up here. And we have another new resonance structure that looks like this. Okay, so what this tells us is that we are now spreading the plus um, not only to the carbonyl carbon, but we also have a delta plus on what we call the beta position. Okay, so if we are going to um, treat this alpha, alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl with a nucleophile, then that nucleophile could, in theory, react with either position that has a partial plus on it. Right? The nucleophile always comes to the plus part. So let's draw the two possibilities. I'll draw one up here. And so I'm going to write this as just a generic nucleophile here. I'm going to put a minus on it. So it's possible for this to do the same reaction that we've already seen and attack the carbonyl carbon. All right? forms its tetrahedral intermediate. We add some water to protonate that. And the reaction is taken place just like that double bond isn't even there. Okay. So in this case, notice that we've added the nucleophile to one position, we added an, an H to the adjacent position. Okay, They're next to each other, so we could call this a 1-2 addition. Right? It's really, you know, it's comparable or analogous to a reaction with just a, a diene like we learned before. Right? We're adding an H, we're adding a nucleophile. We could have been adding an H and a bromide, right? And if they went adjacent to each other, we called it a one-two addition, right? <coughs> this is just a this is just a dying, right? It, the only difference is we have an oxygen on one end. Right? So it polarizes that. And so, you know, it's not, you know. These are all going to go on one direction, and you know we're not going to add the nucleophile to the oxygen, right? Because that would be two negative groups coming together. So the other possibility is that the nucleophile reacts with the beta position. Okay, so let's look at how that'll do that. I'll draw the arrows in green this time to separate them. So it would come in here. We could draw several resonance. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and push these electrons all the way up onto the oxygen. Okay, so I'm going to do a couple of resonance steps here in a row. Just because the oxygen, if there's a minus, that oxygen is going to be the position that holds more of the charge. So we have this. We had an H there already and we've added our nucleophile, okay? Of course, this, I'll just draw it over here, this does have a resonance form. It would have the minus here. Okay, so all I'd have to do is take the electrons on the oxygen, move them down, and move them over onto this carpet. Okay, in fact, this type of anion has its own name. And this type of anion is called, has a double bond, it's called an enolate. Oops, and, oh, I messed that up. An enolate anion. All right, it's reasonably stable because it has this resonance. And so, actually, this is going to lead to more chemistry that we're going to learn in, I think, the chapter after this one. And they do introduce it into this chapter, but I haven't really gone into it. And that tells us that this position alpha to the carbonyl is, is more acidic than we would expect. Because if we pull off a proton, it's anion, and it has resonance. 
So we'll learn eventually that this carbon, with, as this anion, we can also use that as a nucleophile. So that's a whole other type of chemistry of carbonyl groups. All right, so then to finish out this addition, what we're going to do is we're going to do our step two. We're going to add water. And we could do this in several ways. We could just protonate onto the oxygen. It would form an enol. Remember what an enol is? Okay, enols get formed when you do a hydration of an alkyne. Right, you add an H and an OH, and enol is an alcohol that's on a double bond. And what does an enol do? It tautomerizes to the ketone. So I'm just going to take us straight to the ketone. The way we can do this is push these electrons down to form the ketone, and the pi bond can be the one that gets protonated, or that alpha position. We can also get there from this resonance structure, right? <coughs> this resonance structure could just be protonated, and it's going to both get us to the same product. And what we've done now is add our nucleophile to the beta, to the beta position. All right, and the pi bond is now gone. Okay, so what should we call this one? This is called a 1-4 addition. Okay, actually it would be more clear why it's 1-4 if I protonated up here to form the enol, because then we have an OH here, and then we have you know one, two, three, four. We added the nucleophile here and the H, so it'd be one four, right? But that formed the enol, which tautomerizes to give us the ketone. All right, so it adds one more type of examples here. It turns out that when we use very basic nucleophiles like Grignards and organolithiums, they tend to do 1-2 addition, just like we learned before. Okay, so these are going to do 1-2. So we're adding a propyl group now. Okay, so that's going to do the 1-2 addition. We add a Grignard does the same kind of reaction. We protonate, so this puts an ethyl group there. Okay, so what we're saying is strongly basic nucleophiles do one to additions with alpha beta unsaturated carbonyls. Okay, so what's the point? We haven't really added a new reaction. Prates come in that we haven't really talked much about. We, we saw one reaction which was the alkyl cuprate reacting with an acid chloride that went to a ketone, but what these are really good at is doing 1-4 additions to alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyls. And the reason they do that is because they are less basic. Okay, so whatever is on, attached to the carbon there is going to end up attached to the beta position. Okay, there's an H there too. We can do that even down here with a, with a double bond, with a vinyl group. We could do it with a benzene ring. This is going to add that vinyl group oops, to the beta position. We're going to get to like this. Okay, so uh, weaker bases slash nucleophiles tend to do one four addition. 
Turns out in this case, the ketone is the more stable product. So when we use a more weakly basic nucleophile, this addition becomes reversible. So this is more like the thermodynamic product, whereas the 1-2 addition is the kinetic product. If you want to make it analogous to just the 1-3 butadienes. Yeah, question. So, uh, why do you have two equivalents? Okay, so the question is, why do we have two equivalents? This is just the form of this reagent. And only one of these gets delivered. The other one we kind of throw away. There are versions of this where we can... So if you were trying to make a cupre of, instead of something small like this, of something more elaborate, you know, you had to build something, it took a lot of time, and it was precious to you. There's ways to put, like, you know, like a throwaway group, and then it Okay, so I'll see you guys tomorrow.